All right, thank you very much for that introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Is this working all right? Okay, good. All right, so I'll just jump right in. Um, this is my disclosure slide. No one, no one pays me to give my opinion yet. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, I want to first uh, review what my objectives are for this talk. Um, first, uh, one of my main objectives is to review what our data is currently with regards to our uh, rates of post cesarean surgical <laughs> site infection, um, as well as talk about the strategies that are used currently to uh, ascertain this rate. Um, next, uh, uh, I'll present on a series of evidence-based interventions um, that, are, that we're not currently using in a standardized way that could be considered as part of a um, event, uh, prevention package. And then, um, and then I'll move on to talk a little bit about uh, the use of intervention bundles in improving healthcare quality. And then finally, I will offer an example of a set of interventions that could be considered as um, a, a starting point for developing an, an infection prevention bundle here at Merit. Um, uh, so to first go through a little bit of background, um, how many cesarean deliveries do you think were performed in the United States last year? Huh? What is the number of births? <laughs> Two million. Two million? Four million? It's a little bit lower than that. It's 1.3 million. Um, but that's three in ten women will undergo a C section um, uh, as, uh, as the route of delivery for their pregnancy. It's the most common major surgical procedure that's performed in the United States. And last year at Merida, we performed about 1,100 of them. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, 3 to 12% of those women will um, experience a surgical site infection after, uh, after their C-section. Now, you might say 3 to 12%, that's a rather large range, and the reason for that is the ascertainment of um, surgical site infection after C-section, as well as with other types of surgical site infection, is difficult for reasons that we'll get to. Um, it goes without saying that um, uh, Infection in the postpartum period leads to substantial morbidity, cost, longer hospital stays, readmission uh, for women during a very um, important part of their lives. There are numerous risk factors that have been described that we'll touch on briefly, um, but most importantly, national experts, including the CDC, feel that about half of all surgical site infections are reasonably preventable. And really, I think that this was my motivation for presenting on this topic, as well as sort of an interest in this area in general, is the thought that we should really be trying to uh, push this rate down with every intervention that we can. Um, uh, to go through some definitions briefly, uh, the CDC categorizes surgical site infections into three groups, superficial, deep, and then organ space infections. Obviously, it's intuitive to understand what a um, superficial incisional infection is involving the skin, subcutaneous tissue. A deeper incisional infection involves the fascia and muscle. For a post-cesarean organ space infection, that really is uh, predominantly endomyometritis. There are some patients who might develop a pelvic abscess post-cesarean, but mostly um, that would that would generally not occur outside of the context of concurrent endometritis. Um, uh, now, when we consider our patients' risk factors for developing a surgical site infection after a C-section, you can broadly categorize them into these three categories. Patient factors, pregnancy factors, and procedural related factors. Now, I think that you can appreciate how Procedural related factors are something that we can intervene on, whereas patient and pregnancy related factors are more difficult for us to, uh, to impact. And further, you can see how some of the um, uh, risk factors that are included up here um, interact with one another, such as obesity and prolonged labor, as well as a patient's baseline risk of uh, needing a C-section. What you see on the screen here is a schematic that uh, just basically uh, shows that interaction again of um, risk factors and then interventions that can be done to uh, reduce that. So 
to briefly review the things that we already do to try and mitigate surgical site infection. Um, you can probably think of them as preoperative, interoperative, and then postoperative interventions. Preoperative interventions, um, uh, the patients both the night before as well as the morning of will use Corexidine soaked cloths to uh, perform um, basically a whole body uh, prep. Um, in triage, uh, hair will be removed from the surgical site with clippers only if it's truly necessary. Patient, if they're laboring, will be changed into a clean gown prior to going to the OR. And then um, we'll have the timely initiation of indicated antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, during surgery, I think that all of us certainly do our best to use good surgical technique with judicious use of electric cautery, meticulous hemostasis, and tension-free um, wound closure. There's great um, adherence to uh, the recommendation that um, obese uh, patients should have the subcutaneous tissue closed in layers. Um, Chlorexine has become the standard for um, skin prep. And then uh, I can't tell you the last time I closed a fan of steel with staples, so there's a, there's a good um, uh, uptake with that. Um, Postoperatively, um, uh, recently we've uh, been taking off the OR dressing no later than 48 hours, which is an evidence-based intervention. And then we're also doing more um, education regarding incision care and uh, hand hygiene. Um, but to go on to uh, what uh, what sort of more of the main part of my talk, which is what opportunities do we have that might allow us to do that? Um, so to start with uh, a recent um, uh, a recent publication, um, the idea of continuing antibiotic prophylaxis for 48 hours um, after C-section is something that's been examined by. Um, uh, that something that's been examined. Um, a randomized control trial looked at the use of oral Keflex and Flagyl for 48 hours for specifically obese women um, after surgery. And they found a 60% risk reduction uh, for wound complications and endometritis with a relatively low number needed to treat. Um, the secondary analysis, as you might expect, uh, found the greatest benefit for women who have ruptured membranes, um, so a very high risk group. Um, that said, uh, it is just one paper that um, uh, supports the use of post-operative antibiotics in this setting, whereas if you look at uh, the literature um, in almost any other surgical uh, specialty, um, there's, uh, there's evidence to suggest that uh, post-operative antibiotics are associated with more harm and more cost. Um, as you'll see, I'll show what their uh, results show, but there was a very high surgical site infection incidence in the study population. And then furthermore, there was a very long accrual period. Um, I think it was six or seven years. Uh, most of that time um, was before the routine use of extended spectrum uh, antibiotic prophylaxis with the zithromycin. And so it's unclear what the relationship between the two is there. Um, as you all know, azithromycin has a relatively long half-life in tissue, and so it's a reasonable question to ask whether um, you uh, are getting that same effect um, from the azithromycin that the investigators found in this trial. Um, there was no comment on neonatal risks, um, and then furthermore, uh, there was very limited reporting of maternal adverse events, and really they just looked at um, uh, really, they just looked at um, severe allergic reactions. Um, uh, but nonetheless, their uh, findings were, uh, were impressive, especially for uh, patients who had ruptured membranes, 70% risk reduction. Um, so uh, who here likes using an Alexa Yeah, all right. Um, I certainly like using an Alexa um, but uh, the Alexiso has been examined both in the obstetric and non-obstetric literatures uh, for a sort of off-label use as a wound barrier. Um, and the idea behind that is, is that essentially it protects the abdominal incision against contamination during delivery of the baby. Um, it's been looked at three times in the obstetric literature and um, two out of those three trials found that it was beneficial in terms of reducing the risk of surgical sex infection. However, um, the, uh, the best designed of those three trials did not find a benefit, did not also find a benefit. Um, that said, I think that one of the design flaws in um, uh, all three of those studies is that they didn't necessarily stratify patients um, or exclude patients who were undergoing a scheduled cesarean delivery. 
it seems intuitive that um, there's probably li relatively limited contamination of the abdominal incision um, on a C-section that's done on a scheduled basis compared to one that's done uh, at the time of, uh, say, the diagnosis of labor arrest. Um, in the non-obstetrical literature, uh, there are a number of randomized controlled trials that support its use for clean contaminated procedures um, with about a 40 to 50% risk reduction for surgical site infection. The cost effectiveness is something that um, is an unanswered question though. Does anyone know how much uh, an OXSO costs? Huh? One dollar. No. Um, <laughs> uh, it costs about four hundred dollars. Um, so that is something. That is sort of an unanswered question to examine. Um, next, uh, uh, going from one expensive intervention to the next, the negative pressure wound therapy is something that's been looked at a whole lot, surprisingly, in the obstetric literature. Is essentially using a wound back like a Pravina, which I think is the one that's most commonly used here, albeit it is used uncommonly. Um, it's been looked at by no less than two meta analyses um, for just obstetrical patients. One of them was published in AJOG and the other was published in the Green Journal, and they were published two months apart and they actually found opposite results. Um, uh, there's some low quality evidence to, so that seems to support its use in the non-obstetric surgery literature. Um, and the uh, medical plausibility, just to review that, uh, for the use of a wound back for reducing surgical site infection, essentially, um, uh, essentially it works as both a barrier to protect the incision, it works to remove uh, potential material that might serve as a nidus for infection, and then it also promotes wound healing by creating a low oxygen environment that uh, encourages angiogenesis. That said, all that said, even with the uncertainty of um, uh, uh, whether it makes a difference or not, putting that aside, um, it is a very expensive intervention. A Provena for five to, se uh, five to seven days worth of use is $1,600. Um, uh, what you see here is the forest plot from the AJOG article, and the AJOG article was the one that found a benefit, 65% um, uh, uh, or 55% reduced risk for infection. Um, the reason why they were able to find a difference, um, mostly, and the Green Journal article was not, is um, uh, they included uh, preliminary results from a trial that hasn't been published yet. Um, uh, all that. Even with all that in mind, um, there are several uh, sort of cost-effectiveness studies that have been um, that have been published, and all of them seem to argue against the cost-effectiveness of this intervention. Um, all right, so we move from a very expensive uh, intervention that is questionable benefit. We can go to one that's very cheap and there's a great deal of evidence for. So um, I think that most people would say that if I said I wanted to do a hysterectomy and not do a vaginal prep, people would send me back to intern here. Um, but uh, it seems somewhat counterintuitive that, uh, that uh, practice that is a standard of care in uh, GYN is just now really getting, um, it's, uh, getting some attention in the obstetric surgery, surgery literature. Um, unfortunately, it has. It's been looked at twice by two different meta-analyses, one published by the Cochrane Group and the other published in uh, the Green Journal last year. And basically, it shows a rather significant um, uh, and substantial decrease in the risk of uh, endometritis specifically um, in women who have um, an unscheduled C-section. Um, uh, Overall, I think that this intervention is one that um, I know that there's some talk of developing a protocol here at Meritor. Um, I certainly think that uh, this, out of all the interventions I'll present, I think that this one is sort of uh, the one that I would highlight as sort of uh, as one to certainly uh, move forward with adopting. Um, here's the forest plot from the Cochrane <coughs> Review. As you can see, a 55% um, risk reduction in surgical site infection. And then um, the pre-specified subgroup analyses uh, for women in labor, 44% um, uh, risk reduction. And then for women who uh, have ruptured membranes, 
and even more substantial 76% uh, risk reduction. Um, so I think that for unscheduled C-sections, I think the data really speaks for the use of this intervention. Um, now, uh, a lot of our patients are obese. A lot of our patients have, uh, have diabetes, um, either gestational or pre-gestational. And in a way, you could say that there's uh, processes that sort of work in opposite directions. While delivery of the placenta um, uh, will overall make a woman less insulin resistant, the um, uh, stress effect of surgery uh, creates a um, creates, a, creates um, a state where a woman is more resistant to, uh, to insulin. And there's a lot of literature that suggests the association between diabetes and surgical site infection, as well as hyperglycemia in women without diabetes um, with surgical site infection. The CDC, as well as the World Health Organization, recommends interventions be undertaken to maintain good glucose control after surgery. Um, the CDC offers a target of less than 200, based on the finding that if you go from 200 to 250, the risk of uh, uh, surgical site infection doubles. If you go up to 300, it triples. Um, and furthermore, and importantly, um, glycemic control after, uh, after surgery does seem to improve uh, or at least reduce a patient's risk of developing an infection. Um, investigation done in this department into uh, um, <clears throat> glycemic control after GYN surgery um, uh, certainly seems to provide a benefit. Um, all that said, there is variability with regards to um, the glucose targets as well as the um, uh, as well as the approach to managing hyperglycemia. Um, so next, uh, the idea of changing gloves is one that um, some, some people in the department have, uh, have taken up. Um, and it's frequently included in infection prevention bundles um, in, uh, in GYN as well as other surgical literatures. Um, uh, changing gloves is something that, um, as, as, as far as I understand, is just accepted as convention in uh, in colorectal surgery literature. Um, there is one ongoing randomized control trial in Minnesota that uh, is examining uh, the use of a glove changing protocol after uh, during a C-section. And they, uh, they uh, published an abstract with some preliminary results that favor the, um, uh, a policy of glove changing. It, it's also been examined in obstetrics before um, the widespread use of uh, <coughs> <laughs> um, so next, uh, uh, normophobia. Um, so uh, the idea here is that um, uh, basically, or to take a step back, patients who are undergoing a C-section have a variety of risk factors for developing um, hypothermia. They have a neuroxial anesthetic that results in a sympathectomy and an inability to uh, maintain. Uh, peripheral basal constriction, and then um, they also have a lot of work. Um, uh, the benefit for maintaining normothermia uh, was first demonstrated in colorectal surgery literature, and uh, other observational studies have also suggested a benefit. It's something that is commonly included in intervention packages in, um, uh, uh, in national guidelines and guidelines that are published by the World Health Organization. However, there is variability um, in both what the definition of normothermia should be, should be 36 degrees Celsius, should be 36.5, and there's also disagreement as to the best approach um, to maintaining normothermia. But I think that our anesthesia colleagues would be able to provide us uh, with their expertise in terms of um, uh, how to uh, adopt this intervention, should it be chosen to uh, be included. Um, all right. I think that that was all of the interventions that I wanted to review. To move on to this question of what is a, um, a bundle. Um, now, if you've uh, been, if you looked at um, what's been published in like the Green Journal and AJOG uh, over the past few years, you see this uh, idea of a bundle being mentioned over and over and over again. And the idea, um, and while certainly some of those packages that are described 
do represent what a bundle is. The idea for a bundle originally came from the um, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and I'll describe how they define what a bundle is and the philosophy behind it. Um, so, what is a bundle? It's, uh, it is essentially a discrete set of evidence-based practices that, um, that are intended to improve a clinical outcome. These are steps that there's broad agreement that they have value and that they're effective at um, uh, improving patient care. Um, the goal, however, with a bundle is not so much like uh, it's not so much figuring out which intervention should be provided, but rather how can we um, best deliver the interventions that we think are of value. Um, and so it's not so much what, it really is sort of how. Um, there are, it's also important to comment on what a bundle is not. A bundle is not um, a comprehensive uh, listing of all the things that an individual patient should receive as part of uh, for clinical care. It's not a complete list um, of all of the things that might potentially benefit an individual patient um, uh, in terms of a given outcome. And most importantly, it's not um, a magic bullet in and of itself. Um, uh, to go through what the Institute of Health uh, Care Improvement does think a bundle is, though, um, I, I want to sort of share like these guidelines that they offered in terms of developing um, uh, in terms of developing a bundle. So first, a bundle should be a relatively discrete set of interventions that there is broad agreement among clinicians um, regarding their value. Um, the idea is that the interventions that are included, everyone thinks that they should be provided to all patients, so long as the patient meets certain pre-defined uh, criteria. Each component in the bundle should be relatively discreet. It's able to stand alone in terms of its value apart from the other interventions. Um, the bundle as a group should be applied to a well-defined group of patients. For example, a patient with a central line or um, a patient undergoing an unscheduled C-section. Um, a multidisciplinary group helps develop the bundle, and this is important for a few reasons. Uh, first, uh, getting back to that idea of it's not what care should we give, but how do we deliver the care that we think is of value. Um, uh, multiple perspectives are important in terms of accomplishing that. So nursing, anesthesia, obstetrics, um, everyone should be involved in developing, uh, in developing a uh, prevention bundle. And so me, what I'll offer as an example is insufficient to uh, count as a potential bundle. Um, the elements that are contained within it should be descriptive and not proscriptive. And then finally, uh, compliance with a bundle as a whole, as well as in terms of the individual elements, uh, can be measured in an all or none fashion. So whether the patient received it or whether she did not. And this is an example, uh, the, one of the first examples that the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, offered as, uh, as what a bundle should look like. As you can see, there's a relatively discrete set of interventions that are, uh, that are offered. Um, there's broad agreement regarding their value. I certainly think everyone would agree that washing your hands is something that you should do before placing a central line. Um, and each of them stands on its own as part of a whole. And each of them is able to be uh, um, assessed in an all or none fashion. It either happened or it did not happen. Um, and so for your consideration, I'm going to offer um, uh, a series of six interventions that could be considered as uh, basically a starting point for an infection preventing, prevention bottle. And as you know, the first important step is to define the population that you're going to apply the intervention to. And um, for this example that I'll offer, the, I would suggest that the population would be anyone who's undergoing an unscheduled cesarean delivery. So someone who has a rest of labor, someone who presents uh, with ruptured membranes um, and a non-vertex fetus, someone who's in labor who doesn't want uh, who doesn't want a trial of labor after a C-section. So someone who has an unscheduled C-section. So first, standardize the selection timing 
and redosing of prophylactic antibiotics. Now, this is something that we already do well, but there's broad agreement that, um, that for an unscheduled C-section, unless the patient has an allergy to azithromycin, um, they should receive both cetazolam and azithromycin as part of their antibiotic prophylaxis. Now, there's also relatively broad agreement that if a patient um, has a blood loss of greater than 1,500, they should potentially, um, or not potentially, they should get their antibiotic, their cetazolam redosed. Um, and so, improvements in the standardization of how we select and redose antibiotics is important. And then also, I think that there is some improvement that could be made with regards to how we use non-standard um, uh, alternative, the, how we use standard and non-standard alternatives to septic <coughs> in beta lactam allergic patients. I think that there are a lot of patients who don't have a type one allergy who are getting um, non-cephazolin uh, uh, prophylaxis, and there are probably um, some patients who might uh, be otherwise candidates for what is the most evidence-based care. Um, next. Incorporate a vaginal prep into standard cesarean antisepsis. I think that um, the literature suggests that this is a low cost, low risk, and very effective intervention that should be applied to all women who are undergoing an unscheduled C-section. Not women who are undergoing an emergency C-section, but women who are undergoing an unscheduled one. Um, next, changing gloves um, after uterine closure. I think that, uh, again, a low risk intervention that uh, has data to support it that um, would be uh, relatively easy to incorporate into, um, uh, into our practice. This one might be one of the more controversial ones, and this is, uh, and if it is, maybe it shouldn't belong in the bundle as a whole, but I think that the data supports the use of an Alexis for unscheduled C sections in terms of reducing the risk of infection. The question of the cost, effect of cost effectiveness is, um, is certainly very valid, um, and I think it's one that should be examined, but this is something that I would offer as something to consider as part of a, um, as part of a uh, infection prevention bubble. Um, next, maintaining normothermia. This, uh, this suggestion is, uh, is echoed by both uh, the CDC and the World Health Organization as uh, something that will reduce our patient's risk for infection after surgery. And then finally, um, I think that we should monitor for and treat hyperglycemia. Um, our patients certainly have risk factors for this and we have a treatment that can be provided to him or be. Um, if hyperglycemia is present, and so I think that um, uh, just like we do for GYN patients, we should uh, consider uh, evaluation for and treatment of hyperglycemia after a C-section. And so, here are the six <coughs> interventions. Um, I think that uh, at least I hope that you can appreciate how this is maybe an example of a bundle, and that each can stand independent of the others. Each is distinct. They're relatively, um, uh, they're all applied at a relatively distinct point in time, um, and uh, they can be measured in an all or none fashion. And then finally, um, uh, I think that uh, if we do make efforts to try to reduce our patient's risk for surgical site infection after uh, C-section, I think that we need to be doing a better job of ascertaining um, uh, our uh, post-operative infection data. I think that the uh, folks at Meritor um, do an excellent job in talking to them. It's impressive the amount of data uh, that they're able to produce on um, the risk uh, on patients' risk factors and other clinical variables um, uh, for those patients who unfortunately experience a surgical site infection. That said, they're unfortunately hampered by uh, the fact that the vast majority of patients who will experience this outcome. Um, escape their ascertainment simply because they don't follow up in the merit or emergency department. Um, and then finally, uh, it may seem, um, and then finally, I, uh, I would be happy to try to answer any of the questions that you all might have about this, and I appreciate your attention and thank you for the opportunity.
UW, they have an initiative where you don't look under the incisions at all. Um, any information about that? Until you take the incision off right before they leave. Um, uh, so here, I think the uh, standard policy is to remove the uh, OR dressing 48 hours from surgery. I think at UW, um, the policy is similar in that if the patient had a laparotomy, then they're there until um, at or past the 48 hour point, I think that uh, the dressing will be removed at that point. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question or comments. Um, regarding um, uh, body temperature, the, I was wondering how the ice pack that they put over the wound in the post op period will impact the uh, wound healing infection. And uh, I don't know if there's anything there that happens a lot. Yeah, that's a good question. Kind of ways to constrict those vessels. Uh, no, I think that that's a great question. Um, I, um, I, uh, I'm I, not sure, I'm not aware of any specific data that looks at that. Again, I think there you have um, competing um, interests, one, managing post-operative pain, as well as um, reducing patient's risk for, uh, um, reducing patient's risk for surgical site infection. I'm not aware of any data uh, one way or another, unfortunately. And then just a couple comments. Um, I think that the four hundred dollar cost for the LSs is for about the five. Mm. Um, I always believe that these uh, same memories. Um, and that I think that's how it's uh, packaged. So you know, less price, you will see the the price of about the five contractors. Um, and then my uh, other comment is that uh, speaking of surgical um, sterile technique. Um, this is something that I see a lot in old hospitals. Everybody's on board with uh, keeping sterile technique during the whole case. At the end, when you have the last suture, anesthesia drops the tray, they put up, they put a towel over the wound, but they break, they break the scrub before putting the, the actual wound resin on. And everybody's helping to clean, and the scrub tape already grabbed everything from time in itself, and then goes for full grabs. I always try to put the dressing before the plates uh, are removed, but I think that this is not a practice that we all do all the time. And I think it happens most times than, than not. Um, yeah. You know, we yeah. We never do that in a guy. We always play it before breaking scrub, and then people always <coughs> break scrub before dressing the wound. Yeah. It'd be interesting to understand sort of how that um, that practice at the time of C-section developed. Um, there may be differences between the two hospitals. Um, uh, when I uh, when I spoke with uh, DD the other day um, about the patient charge for an Alexa soap, it was four hundred dollars. It's very possible that there's a difference in terms of what the patient is charged, what the hospital pays, um, and uh, certainly that's a very valid. Um, I was going to say that even if you look at the $400, if you look at what the American College of Surgeons said about what an average post op infection or complication, it's about $20,000. If we multiply that times a thousand C sections, the Lexus retractor still would be cost effective because it's $400 and it comes out to like over $500,000. We have all social site infections. So I think we have to the overall cost to the hospitalization that the, is, the, the, the each of the patients gets an oxygen that has an impact and then determine the cost effectiveness. Yeah, um, investigators from uh, uh, Washington University looked at um, the cost for endometritis or surgical site infection after a C section and they found that um, uh, the increased cost is about $3,000 for a uh, superficial or deep infection, and then um, four thousand dollars for endometritis. Great time for us. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> I remember.
remember three years ago when Dr. Thomas gave her grand she actually talked about the vaginal prep. And it really never took off. And what I think is an interesting um, comparison is that when that New England Journal article about Zetromycin came out, it was like rapid oh, yeah. uptake. And I just wonder if you have any um, thoughts or insight about why there's such a difference um, in those two particular evidence-based interventions. Um, I think that. Uh, um, I don't have any, uh, I can speculate, and it's just purely speculation. I think that um, adding azithromycin is uh, something that, uh, I don't know, I think that it's when there's, uh, when you have an intervention that's sort of as um, well sort of like popularized as azithromycin was in the New England Journal, I think that that impacts its, um, its uptake. Um, I think that the uh, additionally, um, there may be some, uh, to get back to the idea of how an intervention is delivered, um, because how an intervention is delivered is important too. Um, for, it really is sort of uh, us ordering as a provost, and obviously there's pharmacy sends it out, pharmacy has it available, anesthesia administers it. But I think in a way it's somewhat easier to apply that intervention. Whereas when I suggest, oh, we should do a bachelor prep for this unscheduled C-section, there's a, there's a huge range of things that are sort of offered as like, oh, let's not do that today. Like, oh, well, um, we're in a rush. Um, or we don't have a protocol. Or uh, do we need to count the sponges? Or do we need to do this or that? I think that um, uh, really it gets to the idea of a bump. This is something that I think that most of us can agree the evidence is there to support it, and it really is how do we make sure that that intervention is being uh, provided. I hope that tries to answer your question. I just wanted to say, I started doing the batch part about six or eight months ago, and when I asked to do it, I got a lot of pushback. Um, to speak to everything that Rock said, the order is a throw, it gets pushed in, it's done. Um, the pushback and the comments that I received were, what do you need, what do we need, how do we do that? And all I said was, I need three, four sets, sponges, and beta diamond, I will do it myself, just get what I need. And um, I did it, but it caused a lot of hubbub, and then I asked for it to be added to my card, and it was, well, what do you need, how can we do this, this is so many special things. Um, and then the anesthesia said to me, so now she has to be on her back for that much longer until you start your C-section. And I, I just, I mean, it's 30 seconds of scrub. Um, and I just sort of pushed back. But I, it was, to me, a very minimal intervention, but it caused a lot of pushback from the nursing staff, from anesthesia. Everybody had a reason why I shouldn't be doing it. And I just said, I'm gonna do it, and I'll do it myself. Um, the commentary that I received in the last couple of months because it's gotten brought to like the hospital and department um, meetings to put this as a protocol. Um, the nurses said to me, you know, it's just one more thing that we have to do during an unscheduled C-section when we're already doing lots of other things and it's more active. Um, but they appreciated that like I stayed and did it myself or that the resident stepped up and did it. So I think having more hands on deck during that prep where we're trying to move as fast as we can once the spine goes in may help with acceptance of that. But that was the exact feedback that I received when I brought that up. It seems like it could be done in the labor room, like when they did the skin. It could be, I mean, I just did it when, I, when they put the fold, when they get ready to put the catheter in, I just quick yes. did it, and it was 30 seconds. But I think they just need to see it in action, and now more of them know, and they feel better about it. But all the comments that Ross said about why they have been heard, that's exactly what I experienced. You just kind of had to push through. I think that it's, like this example is really illustrative of like, why a bundle, um, like the, the sort of philosophy behind a bundle. It's not that we don't think that it works. Everyone seems to agree that this intervention works, but it's really how to get it to every patient that, uh, that matters. Um, we can say, well, we want, the, we want unscheduled C-sections to have vaginal prep performed. Um, that's descriptive. It doesn't say how. It allows 
wiggle room for that to be figured out after there is agreement about what the intervention is. Just for historical, when I first started using defense, I got the same pushback. Um, and, and so, I, yeah, why are you doing, why are you doing this? So I took the ACOG practical teacher associate administrator and said, this is the data. And they had some in-services and it happened. So I think with this, it's the same thing. We've got to take our data to nursing administration and have them on board. And, and I think our will be better. Yeah, they're doing a better job. Great. Ross, great job presenting the evidence. Um, so the, the answer to your question, Kevin, is that there were, uh, when the citronizing came out, the residents started ordering without asking. Um, <laughs> it became an issue in terms of how the health world was going to handle it, and basically you guys order it. Um, so that's where the intervention is to happen. Um, then timely for this presentation, there are three RCTs that were presented last week at the um, in our annual meeting. Um, one of them looked at using Privina, so the uh, one back and did not see any difference. The other one looked at doing a vertical incision versus doing a low transverse um, in obese women and did not see uh, any uh, difference. And you know these are imperfect RCTs, uh, but imagine doing an RCT where you're looking, where you're asking a woman if they want to be randomized to a vertical <laughs> abdominal incision or the primary <laughs> so they a lot of credit needs to be given to them. Um, and then also they looked at the difference in between uh, staples and sutures, and they didn't see any difference, even though they mixed monofilament and uh, vitro. But you know most of these were you know obese patients, but they both groups were pretty similar. So. Really nice job, Russ. Would you be able to go back to the slide where you made the bundle? Um, so I think that number one is, is excellent. Um, I think that number two, just to add a, a couple of comments there, um, it is um, currently moving forward. There will be a protocol. Kathy Fergie um, is developing that with the nursing staff. Um, and, and so that's well underway, and it will happen. Um, it, um, the, the um, one interesting question I think that came of that is what should we do in the setting of an eye allergy um, for the vaginal prep? So I think that's the level of detail that we're at right now from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and the, um, um, the only other comment that I would make on that is um, due to the groups that it showed benefit in, um, as opposed to being an intervention for unscheduled, it'd be an intervention for the labor and the ruptured patient, um, which more or less is, is similar but slightly different. Um, as far as um, number three, I, I think that you laid it out well, and, and ultimately that would sort of be. A, Purview of the person making the bundle. Um, for number four, I think the data there is a little bit challenging. So um, the previous data is really old that was looked at um, from the standpoint of um, from obstetrics in particular, and there was no benefit seen in the, in the old studies. Um, the abstract that you mentioned in the ongoing trial from Minnesota, I think it's really important to know that that outcome was only significant as a composite wound. Outcome um, that included seroma, hematoma, and wound separation greater than one centimeter, as well as infection. None of those things were statistically significantly different, otherwise, the main driver of that was wound separation greater than one centimeter. So, although I think that that could be um, still a very inexpensive intervention to prevent wound separation, I think that we should be a little really careful that we're like as you mentioned, are doing it in an evidence-based fashion. Um, I, I would disagree that in the obstetric literature that there is um, sufficient data to say that it would prevent wound infection, but I think that there could be an argument that it's still a reasonable thing to do for other, for other reasons. Um, number five sounds excellent, and number six um, sounds really interesting, and like it would take a lot to develop the protocol that would Thank you very much.
very much, Ross, for uh, your presentation. Thank you for all those great <coughs> questions. Uh, but be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, we're going to end today. Thank you.